All right, well, thanks everyone for coming out. So uh, today we have Dr. David Hallwell. Uh, on top of being a, uh, a Supreme Prime Ambassador for Eastern Europe uh, <laughs> or something like that on behalf of the SGA. Uh, he has a bunch of credentials to back this up. So he received a Bachelor's in Geology from Burnham University, followed by a Master's in Mining Geology at the Cambourne School of Mines, and then he did a PhD at Cardiff University. So since then, he's worked as an exploration geologist as well as a consultant, and for the past 11 years, he's been at the University of Leicester where he, uh, his research is focused on magmatic and hydrothermal ore deposits with a primary focus on nickel, copper, cobalt, PGE deposits, uh, as well as the additional resources that uh, can be used for environmental technologies. So he's gonna talk to us today and we're very thankful to have him. So Dave, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks guys. And thanks everyone for, for coming out. Um, okay, so uh, good. Good evening, uh, afternoon, good morning. Um, so this talk um, is going to be um, uh, focused on some research that we've been uh, involved in over the past five years, um, a couple of group projects, uh, and they've been focused around uh, what happens in alkaline magmatic systems and the metallogenesis um, and fluxing of chalcophile elements like nickel, copper, PG, tellurium, uh, and gold from a sort of translithospheric perspective. So all the way up from their mantle sources into the lower, middle and upper crust. Um, so this is going to be in two parts. The, the main part towards, towards the end is going to focus on a project which we are referring to as the Flux project. And I'm going to introduce the team here. So Flux being fluxing of carbon and sulphur. Um, so this is stuff that's been led up by myself uh, and Daryl Blanks at the University of Leicester and Marco Fiorentini at the University of uh, Western Australia, the Centre for Exploration Targeting there. Uh, and I'm going to name check everyone because they're all been part of this. So Marilena Moroni uh, in Milan, Andrea Giuliani at TTH Zurich, Santi Tassara at Yale, Jose Maria Gonzalez Jimenez at uh, Granada, and some uh, masters and PhD students, past and present. Um, at the CET, so Joshua Chong, Greg Derry, uh, and the most recent addition to the team is Maria Chidansera. Um, and also part of that team, and also the T's team, which I'll uh, mention in a moment, um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show a little bit of work from, from this project, Dan Smith and, and Tom Knott at University of Leicester, uh, Manuel Kite, who was at Leicester uh, and is now at Germany's longest named university, uh, Marek Lockmellis at Missouri, Ian MacDonald at Cardiff, Yong Jun Liu at the GSWA, Adrian Boyce up at Cirque in Scotland, Elena Ferrari at Milan, and Sean Graham, who was uh, a master's student at uh, Leicester and is now working for Zeiss, based in Singapore. Okay, so that's all the team, and the, 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 what I'm going to show you are, are results of, of a couple of big group efforts um, on this work. So, you may have come here. Uh, thinking that this is a talk about Mordor. Now, um, we will get to Mordor, just not yet, because before we start, we need to start our journey first, back in the Shire, Leicestershire, and the Tees Project. And this is where it all sort of started. Um, so the UK government, uh, a few years ago, uh, funded four major consortia uh, to research um, uh, the geological cycling and recovery of E-Tech elements. So these were critical metals for, for environmental technologies. So things like uh, cobalt, rare earths for use in electric car vehicle uh, uh, batteries, um, wind turbines. And the project that uh, we led at Leicester was the Tees project. So we focused on tellurium and selenium, uh, their main um, uh, application for solar panels and considered critical because of that usage and the expected uh, increase in demand, but also because they are recovered entirely uh, as a byproduct, usually of copper uh, and gold mining. Um, and if you want to want to see more of this and you didn't catch it um, earlier in the, in the year, uh, Dan Smith did a, did a talk about which focused on this uh, T's project um, in order to pause it a couple of, couple of months ago. Um, so within that project, we started looking around and uh, the idea wasn't necessarily to find a tellurium mine or a selenium mine. That's probably not going to happen um, with maybe one or two tiny exceptions. Um, rather, we were looking for uh, ore deposits that could have resources of selenium and tellurium, which could be produced as by or co-products. Um, so there are a number of deposits which are enriched in these elements. 
and the uh, Joe Armstrong, who was up in Aberdeen, part of the, part of the project, um, he put together this lovely little infographic uh, showing which deposits are, are enriched in these. The sedimentary ones are generally more selenium rich, so things like the coals and black shales, sandstone type uraniums. And uh, myself and some more uh, magmatically focused uh, folks, uh, we focus on this sort of setting here where we've got magmatic sulfide deposits um, up into the sort of porphyry uh, epithermal regime. And you can see there's a subducting slab there, so that's uh, one of the key things. So these alkaline magmas and this tellurium rich uh, deposits uh, tended to have um, a sort of common theme where they are sourced from subduction modified um, lithospheric mantle. So this is mantle that has uh, uh, been enriched um, by metasomatic uh, processes and so you get fluid transfer during subduction from the subducting slab into the mantle wedge. Now the tellurium rich deposits are not actually um, uh, focused during subduction in this syn subduction uh, setting where you get the voluminous uh, sort of mafic uh, and, and, and intermediate magmatism and por big porphyry copper systems. Uh, rather, they are focused in the post subduction setting. So, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, um, is the, the tectonic setting is post subduction, where you have, tend to have extension rather than compression. Um, and this is due to when, when um, subduction ceases. Uh, you might get slab rollback, or in the case of this cartoon, uh, slab delamination, a stenospheric upwelling, and you get a little bit of uh, melting of that subduction modified um, lithospheric mantle. Now, the key thing is, and I'm going to come back to this quite a few times, it's low degree partial melting. That is one of the key controls on the style of magmatism and also uh, metallogenesis in these deposits. Um, and that low degree partial melt produces um, reasonably low uh, volume magmatism, but it's alkaline in flavour, it's a little bit hydrous, um, uh, and it can extend uh, all the way up uh, to the upper crust. Now, the link between gold tellurium mineralization and alkaline magmatism has been known for, for quite a while. It's been at least recognised, if not necessarily um, explained. Um, and a lot of the giant gold deposits are in these sort of settings. So the big sort of epithermal um, deposits like Cripple Creek, Ladalam, Lahir, Emperor, all very tellurium enriched, all with alkaline um, igneous rocks associated with them, all in a post subduction setting. Um, and a couple of photos here from Dan Smith from Batakula in Fiji. You do get some um, native gold, but a lot of the minerals are actually uh, tellurides. So things like calaverite, which is a gold telluride. Uh, silvernite here, which is a gold silver telluride. This is a hand lens, by the way, for scale. Um, so I tend to get gold uh, tellurides, silver tellurides. And of course, if you get copper tellurides, then they are the cutest minerals that you could possibly find. Um, so we did some work uh, out at Cripple Creek. Manuel Kite has just had a paper published in uh, Geochemica. Um, on some of the results of that. And this is uh, one of our sort of type examples of this alkaline associated with gold tellurium mineralization in the upper crust um, as, a, as a sort of epithermal style. Um, there are porphyries as well um, in, in post subduction settings, which again have tellurium gold rich flavor, scuries in Greece. Um, is one example, which is also got a little bit of PGEs in them. Um, uh, but from a magmatic sulfide perspective, um, we started to think, well, hang on, if there's a gold tellurium link in alkaline systems, we've got some alkaline ultramafic um, intrusions in the lower and mid crust. Let's have a look at those. Are they gold and tellurium rich as well? And we found that they were relative to normal um, sort of foliatic um, hosted uh, magmatic sulfides. Uh, these are some images from a paper by John Luke Sessa, um, and you can see these uh, big blebs, uh, sort of centimeter scale blebs of sulfide in a alkaline ultramafic uh, intrusion from Italy, which I've come back to. And we've got tellurides in there, and they're relatively gold and tellurium rich. So the intriguing thing was, it's like, well, we don't usually think that 
magmatic sulfides are linked with porphyries and epithermals, but could they be in this sense? There seems to be a, a, a metallogenic sort of flavour to them. So in order to try and uh, test that, um, we tried to find some um, examples which uh, uh, sort of built up towards a lithospheric continuum, if you like. Um, there's very few to zero places on the planet where you can have a nice little schematic like that with everything exposed with magma systems all the way up and um, with little ore deposits. So we had to um, had to scour the globe to, to piece together a sort of uh, schematic. So we found a uh, metasomatized uh, mantle, and that's actually one of the easiest things to find, mantle zenliths. Um, Lower crustal um, alkaline ultramafic pipes and mid crustal sort of lamporphyric uh, intrusions uh, with nickel, copper, PG, gold, and tellurium in. And then up into those porphyries and epithermals. And you can see the metal flavor there. Uh, once you get into the upper uh, crustal systems, you lose the nickel and some of the PG, and then right up to the epithermals, you lose the copper as well. But that seemed like quite a nice little uh, progression in, in, in metal sort of fractionation. So the idea was, well, it, are all of these things sort of linked and how, how do we go about testing that? Well, uh, we took our examples and they're all sort of mineralized examples for a couple of reasons. One is um, by studying where we've got enrichments of these uh, elements that can define the key processes. And also um, they offer samples where uh, we are actually able to uh, measure concentrations of things like PG, gold and tellurium uh, with reasonable um, certainty because they are, are actually some of the rarest um, uh, elements in the Earth's crust. So um, our natural laboratories um, span the globe uh, on every continent. Um, uh, and in doing so, what we were able to do is have a look at this from a global perspective and see whether the same sort of things in alkaline systems were sort of consistent or not, um, wherever you, um, you might be. So uh, our little natural laboratories then, so uh, the mantle zenliths, as I say, they're, they're a little bit easier to find uh, than some of the lower crustal uh, intrusions, but um, uh, Santiago Tassara and uh, Jose Maria uh, Gonzalez Jimenez, we were able to provide us with um, uh, xenoliths from beneath a gold province um, in Patagonia. Uh, myself and Daryl Blanks collected some uh, mantle xenoliths from a carbonatite volcano uh, in Italy. Um, and Andrea Giuliani provided uh, marid type xenoliths uh, from kimberlites in South Africa. Up into the lower crust now. Um, and there are some beautiful uh, little alkaline gold tellurium sulfide mineralization out in the Abrea zone in the uh, Southern Alps uh, in Italy. Um, so we spent a few field seasons up there um, uh, with our colleagues uh, sampling those. Um, and then up into the mid crust, um, so more, more alkaline intrusions, sort of lamprophyric, um, so not, not dikes but lamprophyric style um, uh, lamprophyric composition uh, plutonic rocks uh, so there are some in Scotland uh, referred to as apennites um, and out in northern territory of Australia that's the Mordor complex which uh, I will come back to and Yongjin Lu is able to provide us with uh, samples from uh, porphyries and their host rocks from the Gangdes belt in China which is another one of these um, sort of post-subduction settings. In this case, we've got slab rollback and that asthenospheric upwelling um, and low degrees of partial melting um, and the production of, of porphyries in this sort of system. And Cripple Creek, which I've already mentioned um, in Colorado um, as our sort of uh, end member at the top of the very top of the crust. And so, the way that we uh, analysed these rocks is that we looked at their chalcophile element um, compositions um, and the metal ratios in particular um, allow us to look at various processes that can be happening at source um, and all the way through uh, to deposition. And the way that we plot these um, is uh, like, like a lot of geochemistry, we plot them uh, normalised to, a, to a, a reservoir, in this case primitive mantle. And we've got nickel cobalt on this side, we go through the PGs out towards gold, copper uh, and tellurium. 
So anything along a one line, that's the mantle. Uh, anything above that is enriched, enriched relative to primitive mantle, and anything below it um, is depleted. And so what you might expect is changes in the profiles, uh, the steepness, um, and whether they're arch-shaped or, or flat. Um, and this gives you information about the processes that are going on during metal fractionation um, and deposition. Um, so fractionation steepens the profile, that's one thing that can do, um, and melt extraction uh, would reduce and cause a negative um, a, a, a dip in those profiles. So um, I won't go into this too much, but just to sort of summarize, as we go up through our sort of schematic through, um, through the lithosphere, um, our mantle rocks um, showed us a, um, evidence of low degree partial melting. We can see a flat looking profile which dips down towards um, the right hand side. Now, the key thing again is this is low degree partial melting. We are not melting all of the sulfide in the mantle. For that, you need about 15% mantle melting. We're probably looking at less than 10% in these alkaline systems. What that means is it leaves some sulfide behind. But in doing so, it fractionates the metals from those sulfides. The things with the lower partition coefficients will go into the melt easier. And that's the things along this end, gold, tellurium, and copper. Okay, so that is one of the fundamental reasons why these systems are a little bit more enriched in these elements over things like uh, nickel cobalt uh, and some of the PGEs. You extract that little bit of uh, sulfide, which is relatively enriched in copper, gold, and tellurium, put it up into the lower crust, and we've got these um, uh, sulfides in those uh, pipes in Italy, and you can see there's a, almost a beautiful mirror image in the profile. You've taken things out of that source and you put them up into that sink. Okay, and we've got this nice um, uh, steepening profile. And as we go into the uh, mid crust, we start to steepen the profile because of fractionation. Um, but also there's uh, another factor which is coming in and complicating things. And that's you just starting to redissolve sulfide because as you lower the pressure going up, sulfide becomes more soluble and it will start to redissolve. But in that way, when it starts to redissolve, again, the same um, effect as down here, you're going to put gold, copper and tellurium back into the melt preferentially. Um, so what that means is by the time you get up and if these systems make their way up to the upper crust, um, they are melts now which are nicely enriched and upgraded even in copper, gold and tellurium. So then your hydrothermal effects take effect. Um, you get volatile uh, exsolution um, and out your metals go into a, a copper dominant porphyry or a gold dominant uh, epithermal because the, the, the copper tends to go with a higher temperature um, porphyries and the, the gold into the lower, lower temperature epithermals. And we suggested that we've got a, a real sort of um, progression and a continuum here where all of these things are actually linked and and the, the signatures that we get in these magmatic sulfides in the lower and middle crust are actually part of a system which then maybe goes on to form um, uh, uh, porphyry epithermal or hydrothermal deposits in the upper crust. Now I won't go into that um, too much more. Um, this is all in a, a paper we had um, published in Nature Communications last year. So this is open access and um, so you can navigate to this and, and download the paper um, if you wanna if you want to see more about that. But basically the summary, the link between that alkaline magmatism and the tellurium gold rich mineralization in post-subduction settings is not mutually causative. It's not like, oh, why are these things are tellurium rich? Is it because they're alkaline? Is it something to do with that composition? No, no. Rather, the alkaline nature of the igneous rocks and the copper tellurium gold rich nature are separate functions of the same process. And that is partial melting of a hydrous subduction metasomatized mantle source. Uh, you've also got a little bit of sulfide redissolution on the scent um, as well. So that's the story there. Key point, low degrees of partial melting doesn't melt all the sulfide in that um, source. And so what you do is you have 
copper tellurium gold rich is sort of an inherent um, enrichment over some of the other chalcophytes. Plus those magnas have got volatiles in them, the hydrous um, and a, a little alkaline in flavor. Now, when we were looking at those magmatic sulfides from the lower and um, mid crust, something that we noticed um, whilst doing this was um, that we often found carbonate with the sulfides. Now, as a magmatic sulfide person, um, if you find carbonate, you usually dismiss it um, because you're not expecting it. It's not supposed to be there. We don't find carbonate with magmatic sulfides in general. Um, as something late stage or, or it's to do with fluid interaction or maybe contamination. And a lot of the time that is probably true. Okay, we're not barking up the wrong tree all the time. But this was different. This didn't look like secondary style carbonate. So I'm like, all right, okay, well, let's have a look at this a bit more. Let's go back to our source in the mantle. Have we got it there? And yes, we have. So these are the samples from um, Patagonian Xenoliths. We've got sulfide there with these interstitial um, blebs of, of calcium magnesium carbonate. In this case, we've got the olivine and kleiner pyroxene. Uh, with the sulfide there, there's one of our little telluride friends, the tellurium's in the mantle as well in this source. Um, these Xenoliths from the uh, Bultfontein Kimberlite in South Africa have these pools um, of calcite. And the sulfide is always with the calcite. It's always with the carbonate. And we've got copper and nickel sulfides there and from Volture uh, in Italy. Again, we've got interstitial carbonate calcite in this case with nickel iron sulfides, even with a bit of platinum there as well. And these lovely little globules of calcite and barite. Barite, not a sulfide, of course, a sulfate. Um, but it's showing that there's a carbon sulfur link in the mantle source. Now, that's not necessarily new. There are plenty of studies out there on mantle xenoliths which have noted this sort of um, association as well. But it's pretty interesting that we've got carbon and sulfur. Wherever you find the sulfide, there's usually some carbonate around it. Okay, so we found this quite intriguing because then as we go into the lower crust, we looked at our examples and we've got carbonate in there. So uh, this is a mineral map um, produced using Zeiss's Mineralogic. Um, so this is a, a sulfide bleb, um, so we see it's, it's five millimetres on the scale bar, so we're talking centimetres sort of scale. Um, the pink here is pyrotite, there's some pentlandite in there, but if I um, uh, draw your eye to this um, uh, cyan, uh, light blue coloured uh, calcite around the rims here, uh, there's also inclusions of carbonate, and hey look, there's another one of our little tellurides as well. Um, so there's carbonate inclusions and carbonate around the outside. If we go down here, here's another sulfide bleb. Uh, we've got carbonate inclusions. And this here, if you can see that, that's calcite around the margins with uh, some amphibole, which is one of the primary silicates here. This probably shows it better. This is a reflected light um, image in cross polars, um, which has um, this calcite around the margins. Um, and look at these beautiful sort of meniscus type um, uh, grain boundaries between the sulfide and the calcite. And this does not look like an alteration style. These are not sort of ragged edges with little veinlets uh, intruding down into cracks. This is, this is something different. Uh, this looks fairly primary. Let's have a look in the mid crust. One of our examples is from uh, an intrusion called uh, Srongarp in Scotland. Uh, we've got blebs again. Um, look, sort of, sort of centimetre scale blebs, in this case pyrite, chunk of pyrite, with calcite uh, right next to it. Again, fairly clean boundaries here between the sulphide and the calcite. There's a thin section image, calcite and sulphide, and some calcite um, without sulphide as well. And if you're looking at that image in A and thinking, I can see, I, I think I can see a unicorn there. Yes, you can. Um, so there it is with its little uh, uh, horn there and some laser beams coming out of its eyes. It's maybe an evil unicorn uh, with, with there's its front um, uh, hoof there. Now, okay, so it's like, right, okay, these the, texturally, these don't look secondary or from contamination. Let's just check the isotopes, um, and we did. Um, so here's the, the isotopes from those samples that I've just shown you, and you can see the delta 13C, uh, the carbon isotope is, generally between about minus eight and minus five. It's a classic sort of primary magmatic 
carbonate uh, isotope signature. Uh, the oxygen isotopes are skewed a little bit to the right. Um, you can explain that with a little bit of low temperature um, hydrous alteration, but these look like magmatic signatures for carbonate. And the sulfides as well have magmatic signatures. So we're fairly confident that these blends of sulfide and carbonate are mantle derived, which is interesting. Okay, any more examples? Well, the ones that I've shown you so far are fairly small intrusions. Now, this is relatively low volume magmatism anyway, but one of the biggest examples of these alkali is, um, complexes uh, from the mid crust. Um, is the Mordor alkaline igneous complex, which is in right in the centre of Middle um, uh, in, in centre of Australia, <laughs> Middle Earth indeed. Uh, there's Alice Springs, um, and if you go out uh, on the Ross Highway uh, to the east, uh, you get to the Mordor alkaline igneous complex. Now, this whole area, this part of the uh, Northern Territory, and this Arunta block is a, a beautiful example of um, a mid crustal exposure. Um, so, some wonderful structures in there. Um, and if you want to do a little bit of a, um, a, 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 a digital field trip uh, this afternoon or after this, I'd recommend uh, navigating to Alice Springs on um, Google Earth and having a look around at some amazing structures that you can see, some fantastic fold interference patterns. And also you may come across this unusual feature. This sort of three-sided, um, uh, a mountain range. Now around those three sides, inside it, is the Mordor alkaline igneous complex made up of cyanite and these alkaline mafic ultramafic rocks. Now those of you who know uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings are probably thinking well hang on is, is there some link here between Mordor in, the, in Lord of the Rings and this? Well actually yes that's how it got named because um, uh, if you have a look in Tolkien's books, you will see maps of Mordor, and it looks like this. So, um, a remarkable and seemingly unfeasible uh, right-angled three-sided mountain range. Uh, but actually, that's that's what we've got out near Alice Springs. Um, the North Arrow um, um, is slightly different, granted, but maybe there was a pole reversal uh, in the meantime. And uh, this inspired the uh, survey geologists um, in the 60s to name this area Mordor Pound. Uh, now, again, if you know the, the, the story, you'll know that there is uh, a mountain uh, at Mordor, a Mount Doom, and the highest peak in this mafic ultramafic complex has been referred to and uh, called Mount Doom as well. And just so to complete the, the reference, there are some hobbits uh, probably stood out here looking uh, in towards Mordor and wondering how they're going to get in. Um, so that's what we did. Um, we went out um, and this is a Trophina Gorge, this little campsite behind here and you can view out into that sort of three-sided box shape. You can see Mount Doom there which is a lot less terrifying than it is uh, in the books and films. Um, and uh, there's the extent of the igneous complex. So it's sort of uh, five, six um, uh, kilometres uh, across, so it's pretty big. Um, so we were going to go in uh, and do some field work on the ground, um, but it was a little bit more difficult. So the whole area um, was actually fenced off. And um, you say, well, probably hop over with that fence. Well, no, actually, that's a, a cattle station, and Australia has some fairly uh, stringent biosecurity laws, so it was difficult to um, to gain access to that. So uh, we should have really known that because if there's one thing that anybody knows about Mordor it's that one does not simply walk into Mordor, and we couldn't. <laughs> in fact, it was very difficult to even drive into Mordor. Thankfully, some people already have, and they've been drilling there as well. So there's been a few episodes um, of drilling of the, the Mordor complex over the years. Um, in the center, if we look at this map here, we're, we're focusing on the mafic and ultramafic part. Um, this is alkaline still. Um, so in the area around Mithril and Mount Doom, uh, there are ultramafic layered sequences which have PG reef style mineralization. Um, Steve Barnes wrote a paper on that um, in 2008. Um, but we were interested in mineralization, which is actually closer to the margins out here in, in wonderfully named Shonkenites, uh, which I think is a, a name which has gone out of fashion 
uh, tragically, uh, they are effectively mafic cyanides. Um, so they've got the mineralogy of, of K feldspar, uh, phlogopite, apatite, um, orgite, and olivine. Um, and you can see there's a couple of drill holes here with some mineralization with copper uh, and platinum, palladium, gold uh, as well. So we were interested uh, in, in these. Uh, and we've got a paper coming out in MINDEP uh, soon uh, on this. And so we were able to access those cores, thankfully. So we didn't, it didn't actually matter that we could not walk into Mordor. Um, and again, these are blebby looking sulfides. So the sort of centimeter scale blebs around the margins of these intrusions. Um, so interestingly, so we thought, right, okay, let's have a look, see if there's carbonate in here. And we were running the, the, the acid down the cores um, and it was fizzing but it tended to fizz only where we put the acid over the sulfide, but in the sulfide. So this is pretty interesting, okay? So we've got sulfides again with carbonate again, and they're blebby sulfides as well. So we had a look at some of these, got the thin sections done, and sure enough, chalcopyrite, inclusion in pyrite, those are the blebs, and there's a little bit of millerite in here as well, and calcite there as an interstitial phase in some of these sulfides. So this is like, okay, this, this seems to be a thing. In the lower and mid-crust, in alkaline systems, our magmatic sulfides tend to have carbonate, primary carbonate um, associated with them. Now, I made the point that these are blebby, okay? So these are quite, quite big um, sulfide blebs, but there's a problem here because um, if we're thinking about how these things are actually moving up into the crust, um, large blebby sulfides are going to be dense, okay? Um, sulfide droplets are dense, they should sink, and things that are that big shouldn't really be able to make it out of the mantle, um, and certainly shouldn't be um, working their way up into the lower and mid crust, um, unless something else is going on. So that, that is our problem here. So, going back to the textures, in those lower crustal rocks, these really remarkable ones. Now I'm going to put up one um, which showed this first. This was from a paper from uh, Gianluca Sessa. And you can see one of these blebs here. There's a centimeter scale bar, so these are pretty big. But around the margins, you've got this blue colored um, carbonate with these sort of lovely, uh, like this type um, uh, margins. Uh, to the sulfides. Um, and actually, if you include these symplectites in there, they start to look a little bit more rounded, almost like they're sort of bubbles attached to the side. So have we got like maybe two liquids here? Are these not just blebs, are they bubbly blebs? Now bubbles are pretty useful because what bubbles can do is they are a way of floating heavy things. So uh, the best industrial example of that is froth flotation in an industrial process um, on mine sites to concentrate ores. Um, so what happens here is you inject air um, into liquid, the bubbles float to the top, your powdered um, uh, ore pulp gets put into there and things like sulfides are hydrophobic. So they will stick to the bubbles and will float up even though they're heavy. Um, and then you get the bubbles coated in this sort of uh, shiny sulfide bridge. Uh, um, concentrate at the top, which can be um, uh, skimmed off. Great. Does this happen in magnets? Little studies uh, in the last few years, which have shown that this is probably happening, um, or can happen at least, in the upper crust. So bubble enhanced transport for dense uh, minerals or, or liquids has been proposed. The first one, um, uh, well, um, a major one here in, in 2015 in Nature Geoscience, Jim Mungal and his co-workers, they showed experimentally that uh, vapour bubbles, uh, sort of upper crustal conditions, um, and sulphide liquid, they wet each other and they will stick to each other and you get compound droplets of vapour and sulphide. And depending on the volumetric ratio of them, you can actually effectively, these things can start floating up through magnets and um, the vapor bubble um, and with, with the sulfides um, uh, stuck to them uh, that upward buoyancy um, overcomes the downward gravitational pull 
Excellent, okay. There was a talk a few weeks ago, um, excellent talk on El Laco by Adam Simon uh, and his group have done a similar sorts of experiments, uh, which we talked about in our talk, um, on magnetite. So these are actually crystals of magnetite, which again can be floated upwards uh, by hydrosaline uh, fluids and vapours. So this is an all concentrating mechanism when, we, when we're focusing on uh, when we are, are looking at ore deposits, the, you, you need a mechanism to concentrate things. And with heavy stuff like sulfides um, and oxide minerals, we tend to think up from up to down because these things should sink. But actually, you attach bubbles to them and we could get an upward um, concentration mechanism. That's certainly what they proposed um, for those El Laco magnetite flows, um, that actually they're magnetite being floated upwards. Interesting, okay, that's the experiments. We've got um, empirical evidence as well. This paper by uh, Margot Levayant and, and co-workers and people from uh, Steve Barnes's group have done uh, more of these uh, uh, studies where we've got sulfide uh, blems again. So these are pretty big, should sink, um, but they have these silicate caps to them, hydrosilicate caps, which are thought to be uh, sort of fossil bubbles, if you like. So we've got some really good evidence that actually sulfides can be transported um, by vapor bubbles, um, and certainly a blebby style sulfides can. Now, where's this going? So can we see this in the lower crust? All the experimental work so far has been related to mostly hydrous fluids in the upper crust. So can we have this happening in the lower crust? Could we have these compound droplets causing a bit of buoyancy and helping to flux our metals across the moho, basically. And if we can, what would the volatile phase be? Um, now, this paper by Yao and Mongal came out uh, just a few weeks ago uh, in EPSL. And just towards the end of that, there's a beautiful sentence for us that says, although our thermodynamic models for the timing of sulfide volatile saturation focus on magmatic systems in upper crust, the dynamics of compound drops are non-pressure sensitive and therefore the flotation scenario can extend to the mid and lower crust. Great, in the event that the magmas become vapor saturated at those high pressures. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a constraint there. So for us to be able to invoke this sort of process happening in the lower crust, we've got to have a situation where those mantle melts are both sulfide saturated and volatile saturated as well. Okay, so let's go with the sulfide first. Now, in most mantle uh, melts that form foliatic and certainly comartiatic magmas, uh, they are undersaturated at source because you melt all of the sulfide. But if there is residual sulfide left, then the sulfur concentration in the silicate melt by definition is the sulfur concentration at sulfide saturation. So low degree partial melts, remember what we're looking at here, uh, alkaline melts, low degree, maybe less than 10%, they won't fully melt the sulfide, so they should be sulfur saturated. Also, we got a negative correlation between pressure and sulfur solubility, so the deeper you are, the more likely you are to be sulfide saturated. So yes, these melts should be sulfide saturated, and not only that, we've got the evidence for that anyway, those lower crustal pipes um, from, um, uh, from Italy show us that. We've got mantle signatures in the sulfides and the carbonate, and there they are. Okay, so they're definitely sulfide saturated. Okay, now we need a volatile. So what's our volatile gonna be? You can probably guess, because I've been talking about carbonate for the past 20 minutes, that we're gonna propose it's CO2. So can we get CO2 supersaturation as well? Well, CO2 uh, and other volatiles uh, act incompatibly. So when you start to melt the mantle, um, they will go into the melt straight away. So this diagram shows that. So this is CO2 concentration over here. This is percentage melting. So as you increase the percentage of melting, you actually decrease, dilute the concentration of CO2. At, in this case, we've got three different um, starving compositions. So if you start, for example, with a relatively uh, enriched mantle, maybe metasomatized, maybe, um, and you've got like less than 10%, between one and 10% melting, 
you're going to get around about one percent a couple of percent co2 in that melt which can make it super saturated that's enough okay this is great not only that mantle melts can and will uh, assimilate off the pyroxene um, as they are, are making their way through those mantle pyrolytides. What that does is it increases the silica content of the melt. And increasing the silica content actually reduces the CO2 solubility. So this compounds what I've just said in the previous slide, um, and the silica contamination can actually promote CO2 saturation. It also actually lowers the sulfur carrying capacity, so it makes it more likely that it's sulfide saturated as well. So basically, yes, in these sorts of melts, certainly, we're most likely, our mantle melts are probably sulfide and CO2 saturated. Great. And that CO2, by the way, is not going to be like a gas. It's not like opening a, um, popping the cork on your favourite bottle of uh, fizz. Um, these are not um, gaseous bundles of CO2. It's going to be at that pressure um, a supercritical fluid. But once that is denser than a bubble of CO2 gas, it is still less dense than a silicate magma and less dense than a sulfide liquid. And therefore, if the sulfide liquid sticks to the CO2, then we can have a little bit of buoyancy in a compound droplet. And that's what we think is happening. That's what we think we've got the evidence for. And um, it's backed up by um, experimental work. And in the lower crust, we think we've got something like this going on. Um, so we've got CO2 supersaturation with a supercritical fluid. Uh, we've also got sulfide liquid saturation as well. And those things stick to each other because they have nice strong wetting behavior. And um, those uh, experiments uh, from Jim Mongal show that. And we can float these things up. And this is a good way of getting blebs, you know, fairly large um, sulfide droplets to overcome that inherent density contrast, which would normally uh, drag them down up into things like those lower crustal intrusions, um, for example, Valladja um, in the Italian Alps. Cool, so that's happening in the lower crust. What happens when we get up into the upper crust? Now remember, one does not simply walk into Mordor, and those sulfides did not simply walk into Mordor either but they may have been carried in by volatiles, certainly those ones um, along the margins with all the carbonate associated with them. So you think about this like a little journey, if you want, they start off um, in a fellowship, the carbon, the sulfur, all the metals. Um, but as that journey continues up through the lithosphere, they start to separate some fall by the wayside. Um, and some of the evidence from strong garb maybe shows there's a little part in here. We've got calcite at strong garb, which is not associated with sulfide. So what happens when you go a little bit further up? Because if we look at magmatic sulfide deposits uh, in the upper crust, we just don't see this same carbonate sulfide occurrence. Uh, sometimes see carbonate there when it's been contaminated, but not this mantle-like signature. Well, that's quite intriguing, but there's maybe a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, the CO2 can degas, and also the sulfide can redissolve in that mid to upper crust. Um, so as the pressure decreases, sulfides start to redissolve. So we may get a, a, a case where the sulfides have redissolved, the CO2 is there, got, therefore got nothing to stick to, uh, and we get a separation. Um, so what we're seeing down in the lower crust and up into the middle crust, uh, the association may be gone by the time we reach the upper crust, where we basically we study most of our rocks uh, and deposits. So because of that, we're going to call um, carbon a, a covert agent um, in this metal fluxing. So it happens low down, um, and it's not often that we see the evidence of that, but it could be a pretty fundamental uh, process, certainly in these alkaline systems of getting those metals out of the mantle um, and into the crust. And so we put this together. Um, so we've got low degree partial melting, um, which gives us uh, sulfide and CO2 saturated um, ultramafic alkaline hydrous melt. The sulfides are the, the CO2 and float their way up into the mid, uh, lower crust and then the mid crust we may start to see separation of the two um, and then redissolution of that sulfide as well. 
But that's still a good thing because even if we resolve the sulfide, we, we basically concentrated our metals into sulfides here and move them up into the crust. If we resolve them, then the magmas that maybe reach the upper crust in that case are primed with those metals. Okay. And then if you trigger sulfide saturation by contamination, for example, like at Norilsk, maybe add in a load of um, uh, anhydrite, some sulfur, some coal as well to reduce things, you've got a deposit there and the metals are ready to go into sulfide there. And so, as an analogy, um, if you think about this as a rocket, so a rocket needs to get off the ground, okay? Our sulfides need to get out of the mantle and up into the crust, okay? And they are heavy. A rocket is pretty heavy. So to get it off the ground, it needs a real thrust at the beginning. Um, and that's why rockets have initial, like extra fuel boosters um, to get it off the ground. It's essential in getting that precious cargo in case of our, our sulfides, their metal cargo, out of the mantle um, and into the crust. And one, but once spent, what happens to the fuel tanks? They separate. So maybe a similar situation here, where we've got our, uh, in the lower crust, we've got our sulfide and carbonate um, together. And then as we get up into the mid crust, our CO2 and sulfide sort of separate. So by the time it reaches the upper crust, we don't actually see the evidence of that. It's very hard to fingerprint this process but it may be a very important process that's happening um, lower down. So um, this talk has been uh, well-timed, um, not by uh, luck rather than design, uh, but this paper, um, which uh, the, the second part of that talk on the, the CO2 fluxing, that has just been accepted last week uh, in Nature Communications, so that should be out um, in a couple of weeks' uh, time. Um, in September, so you can keep a look out for that. That will be um, uh, open access again. Uh, and also, if you're interested in Mordor, um, that, uh, we've got a paper in MINDEP, which has just been accepted with some minor revisions. So uh, there'll be another Mordor paper uh, coming out as well, if you're interested in that. So as a summary, these alkaline magmatic systems, post-subduction settings in terms of their tectonics, they have a characteristic gold, copper, tellurium, metallogenic DNA, if you like. Um, and one of the fundamental controls on that is that we have low degrees of partial melting of probably a metasomatized mantle. So we've got enrichment in the mantle source, and then we've got low degrees of partial melting, which preferentially fluxes copper, gold, tellurium over some of the other um, chalcophiles. Now, in these systems as well, that can trigger sulfide and CO2 saturation at depth in the lithosphere. And what that allows us to do is to maybe have a physical mechanism to flux these sulfides and metals um, up into the crust. Now the question then, and you may be, you may be thinking this, could this actually happen in other magmas? Um, so it's like that's very well for um, alkaline magmas, but is that relevant to, to others? Well, in these magmas, we're talking about um, mantle-derived carbon and sulfur, um, but let's say a tholeitic magma, which might be sulfide and CO2 undersaturated um, at source, that interacts with some rocks in the lower crust and gets contaminated by, let's say, sulfide and, and, and carbonate. Why couldn't you maybe have the same mechanism happening, um, but from a contamination perspective as well? So that's something uh, that we are working on um, currently. And of course, one does not simply walk into Mordor, we've learned that uh, if we didn't know that already. Um, so uh, to finish off, I will uh, leave that slide up. Um, uh, that's that's going to be uh, the paper on, on this coming soon. Um, and uh, thank you. I'm happy to take some questions and I will do my best to answer them. Okay. All right. Well, that was absolutely awesome. <laughs> I think that was a fantastic talk. Uh, we already have questions on deck, which probably also attributes it to being a fantastic talk. So um, with, with that being said, we do already have questions on deck. So I am going to go right ahead. I want to ask uh, Nick Arndt if you'd like to be unmuted and uh, to ask his question to you directly. So Nick, if you're there. So so here's, a, here's his comment that I think he was going at. Um, 
Their pressure effect is such that as a magma moves upward from its source, it moves ever further away from sulfide saturation. Unless sulfur is added or something yes. happens like crystallization, temper drop, or contamination, yep. the magmas are going to be sulfur undersaturated when, yep. they, when they enter the crust. Yes. No, yeah, th that's true. I mentioned that. But that, that is the case if you have exhausted the sulfide when you are uh, during mantle melting. So for these lower degree partial melts, they should still be sulfide saturated because if you've got residual sulfide, um, then the, um, the sulfur content of the uh, melt will be at sulfur um, content of sulfide saturation. So they will be sulfide saturated. The higher degree partial melts, so tholiatic and, and commodiatic, yes, they will be sulfide undersaturated probably to start with. And as, as I said, that once you uh, go up through the crust, they will become even less so. So these ones that we're talking about, which start off sulfide saturated, and we've, we've got the evidence from those lower crustal pipes that they are those um, mantle-like sulfur isotopes that in fact, they can't even be contaminated because they haven't even reached the continental crust. They're intruded into the uh, mafic underplating. Um, so there are examples, we, th we think these alkaline melts, these low degree partial melts, are actually sulfide saturated um, at source. But they will, as they progress upwards, as we were saying, that the sulfides will tend to redissolve back into the melts and they will become undersaturated the further up you go. Well, I hope that's uh, satisfactory for Nick if he uh, if he does come back and hear that. It's satisfactory for me. I don't know any better. It sounds convincing. Um, we we do have uh, we do have more questions on deck. Uh, oh, okay. Nick's back in. Uh, okay, he said he can't be unmuted. I'll I'll maybe I'll unmute him and you can give him that answer again if you don't mind. If he's curious. Uh, same answer. Uh, well, well, let's see. He's, he's back now. Let's see what he what he did. Did, did you hear me, Nick? He might not have. I've asked to unmute him once more, just in case he missed out. I hope he heard you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do, do you want me to repeat it, or should we? Should oh wait, we no, no. Can you hear me? I'm un, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Hello, Nick. Yes. Yes. Most. Yeah. Sorry, most I've got a bad connection here. Should be. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> okay to be um, uh, undersaturated, um, uh, sulfide undersaturated at their source if they melted all the sulfide in the mantle. Um, but if, if we got the lower degrees where you have residual sulfide, there should still be sulfide saturated. And certainly uh, we've got the evidence from those lower crustal pipes that we've got mantle-like sulfur isotopes um, in rocks that have not actually even reached the continental crust. So um, they are um, sulfide saturated. But it's probably only in these um, lower degree partial melts. Well, am I sorry? I, I do not agree. I don't think I don't agree because, you know, I agree that the the um, if the low degree melts will be sulfur saturated yeah. when they leave their source, and the high degree yeah. melt may not be. Yeah. But let's say the magma contains 500 ppm sulfur when it leaves yeah. the source. Yeah. When it gets into the crust, that magma, because of the pressure effect, is capable of dissolving, let's say, 1,000 ppm. That's the pressure effect. So that means that even yeah, if no, the magma... I mean, huh? hmm? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And we did say that at, at some point, those sulfides will redissolve back into the melt. Um, what's maybe not so clear is at what depth that happens, and that'll be a function of how much sulfur is in there to begin with. Um, but yes, they, they should redissolve, and anything that is even sulfide saturated at depth going into the lower crust should become undersaturated um, That's right. as it goes up. Yeah. Yes. And then you need okay. a second trigger, um, maybe in the upper crust, when you interact with some uh, uh, crustal rocks to trigger sulfide saturation later on. Yes. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, so sorry to, to make you repeat that one. It was just, uh, I'm sure Nick was curious about the answer there. Um, we, we do have more questions on deck. We have lots of good questions on deck. Uh, we have coming, one coming through from, I hope I say your name right. I think it's Josie Maria Gonzalez. Uh, I'm going to ask him mute you, and you can ask Dave your question directly if you'd like. Good morning uh, from Spain. Do you hear me, Dave? 
Yes, I can. Morning. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your talk. It's uh, very clear, very instructive. And I have a, a very short question where you show um, this model in the in the first part of the talk, this uh, model where we have the different patterns of PD from the mantle to the grass. We, in your talk, we are talking about the, the fractionation of the PDEs depending of uh, the sulfide fractionation too. But my question is, what is the role of the, the or what do you think about the, the, the role of the metal nanoparticles in all this history? Because we, we know, we, we, we have found recently different suite of PDMs. Uh, PDMs, when I tell PDMs, is a very tiny, tiny grain of micron size, always uh, um, nano size uh, uh, PG minerals. What is it, the, what do you think is the role on, of them in this transport of, of the metals from the mantle to the crust? Uh, yeah, okay, so th this, I think on, a, on the scale that I'm looking at, uh, or at least that we're referring to there, um, whether the PGs are partitioning into sulfide liquids um, sort of ionically um, or as nanoparticles, um, effectively they are still getting um, carried and transported um, uh, within sulfide liquids. Um, now, if those nanoparticles are present, um, so if, if you've got more than one PGE sort of uh, as part of a micro PGM, yeah, that, that could uh, complicate the signature a little bit. I'm not sure, I mean, do, do you have an idea of whether, whether any of those metals might it might make a real big difference to a, a let's say a positive or negative anomaly on, on those on those graphs. I I have a, a, a suspicion uh, in which uh, probably uh, if you have the these um, these metals when I'm telling these metals about the PGs, uh, either um, they are as nanometers or nanoparticle attached to the sulfide. I think they, they will control all this fractionation if they remain in the in the liquid in the in the silicate liquid or in, if they go to the sulfide. It's not very clear now, but I think we I just uh, showing this question not to to complicate the situation. Just to think if something because I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. It's just to to put the the question to the community if some someone has more. Okay. More answer to us because I I don't have I don't have clear the, the the situation yet. Yeah, it's, it's something it's something to consider rather than just thinking of these things as uh, uh, sort of elemental or, or ionic right, as yeah. the, the the nanoparticles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dave. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Jose, for for the question. I think it's it's interesting to think about this sort of as competing uh, sort of. Con Competing transport mechanisms between sort of flotation, if you want, versus versus this ionic bonding, like you just said. And in fact, um, we have another question from Catherine Goodenough, a uh, friend of Four Deposits Hub, uh, about other volatiles in the system. So, Catherine, I can go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to ask your question. Thanks, and thanks, Dave. Brilliant talk. Um, you know. Talked about this before. We're all working on this post subduction alkaline magmatism and we're looking at it from the rare earth element angle. Mm. And we, we're looking at very similar systems. We see that association of carbonate and barite that you've described. Yeah. But um, of course, we're looking at a lot of uh, fluorine and chlorine in the systems. You know, in particular, when you look at the upper mm -hmm. parts where you see a lot of carbonatite, there's a lot of evidence for fluorine associated yeah. with these systems. So, have you thought about? fluorine and chlorine and their role in transporting metals and sulfides potentially at greater depth? Yeah, so um, that, is, that is a good question. So um, uh, certainly I can see that, that, that they have a big role over, let's say, the rare earth elements. The more chalcophile elements, um, uh, I think the, the, is the, where you have the sulfide liquid and their, their, their highly chalcophile nature. That said, uh, there is probably um, uh, a story in there. These these melts are fairly hydrous. There are plenty of fluids around. There's evidence for fluorine and chlorine. Uh, chlorine. Um, 
because uh, you often see a little bit of appetite uh, in these things, either fluorine rich or, or chlorine rich. So um, maybe maybe down in the mantle, um, yes, maybe, but I, th I think w in that initial part there where we are uh, thrusting sulfides up into the crust, um, I, I think that in terms of these chalcophile elements, it's the sulfide that is the dominant force, but that's not to say um, that certainly things like maybe uh, gold or some PGs might be mobilized or, or fractionated with uh, by the halogens, yeah. Thanks, Dave. I feel at some point we should swap some samples from the two sets of projects to you know, okay. see, what, <laughs> see, see what results or what ideas we get out of looking at each other's samples. It could be quite interesting. Sure. Okay. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks again, Dave. Um, actually, I'd like to ask if um, Steve Steve Barnes would like to. He's he's had some comments in the in the chat. I don't know if he has a direct question, but I think he can provide some interesting discussion on the metal content of the mortar complex um, yes. and how that differs from other systems. So I'll unmute you, Steve. Um, okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, great talk, Dave. Really interesting stuff. Um, oh, yeah, I just posted just a couple of comments in response to other people's questions and comments. Um, one about the, the issue of um, the pressure effect on surface solubility. I think that the, the thing to consider there, if you're dealing with volatile flux alkali magmas, they're probably actually ascending really fast, um, you know, based on what we know about kimberlites and things. Um, so I'd say that the, the, the chances are that it's, it's, it's a time scale issue. They're coming, but going to be coming up way faster than any sulfide droplets could dissolve. The yes, dissolution of sulfide droplets is actually quite slow. So, yep. um, so I think that probably gets you out of that one. It's just a kinetic effect. Um, and um, yeah, then uh, the, 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 um, the other point that, that Jose raised about the, um, whether uh, sort of metal phases could be playing a role. I just went back and had a look at the, at the data from the sulfides I looked at at Mordor, and they're, um, they're platinum palladium rich, but they're, they're really low in, in osmium osmi meridium ruthenium. So the implication might be that you know, they've, they've dropped metal phases somewhere, and the, the simple explanation would be they, le they left them behind. So, um, so, so, yeah. the vo so you know, if your story is right, and I really like it, I think it, ex it explains a lot, then um, your, your volatile phase is basically um, uh, uh, transporting, you know, it's rafting the sulfides out, but it's leaving the it's leaving the solid MSS and the solid metal alloys behind, and just taking with it the the the, um, that, the, the more easily dissolved, um, so that, you know, pop, is, low, low yeah. melting component. That is exactly it, Steve. Um, you you are only you are incongruently melting uh, that sulfide at source, and you're leaving behind a significant MSS portion, which is where a lot of the IPGs will be, and in all of these systems that we we're looking at, um, these uh, alkaline systems, particularly those ones in the mid crust, like like Mordor or Srongarb or things like that, they have um, really high sort of um, palladium to iridium ratios, uh, and they are generally a little bit nickel depleted as well. Um, so they're copper, um, maybe platinum palladium, but no IPGs as well. So yeah, agree on that. So I actually have a question along these lines uh, for, for you, Dave and, and Steve, as well. In the upper crustal systems, then, how are you transporting the gold and tellurium uh, without the sulfur or the, the CO2? Like, well, what's the system here? Is this more ionic bonding or is this another? Yeah, so, so that, then they're just sort of trace, trace elements in your, in your silicate magma. Um, once, you, once you've totally dissolved um, or totally melted that, that, that sulfide in the mantle, then though those just go in the, the sort of maybe 10 ppb um, levels in a, in a let's say tholeitic or, or kamatiitic melt, and they're just transported um, and dissolved in that silicate melt. Okay, and then the crystallization. Whereas, is just whereas a this mechanism, you sort of pre-concentrate them in the sulfide. Okay. Uh, the gold in the tellurium as well, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Chris, how are we for how are we for questions? Uh, we do have a few more uh, coming from Jack Freeman. If Jack would like to uh, ask his questions directly, I'm going to ask to unmute you and uh, feel free. Oh, good. Hi, Dave. Thanks for the talk. Um, Hi, I think I've got a couple questions on the concentration of your deposits. 
So just in, in like a broader scale in your in your yeah. model, uh, what role do structures pre-existing in like the thrust arc or the back arc play in your in your in your melt movements? And then is it are they there to inhibit um, your sulfur saturation or are they going to aid the movement of your of your pipe structures in terms of like sills or is it just a straight kimberlite um, movement? Good question, actually, and we haven't really focused too much on the structural controls. I would say that, yeah, they, they like most magmatic systems, they will probably um, uh, exploit pre-existing uh, structures. So, um, I think I'm making might, it more perspective or less perspective? Um, uh, it might depend on, um, so, uh, whether those uh, mantle tapping structures then provide a pathway to um, suitable crustal rocks to interact with. Um, so uh, once, we, once we've got up into that upper crust and we've redissolved our sulfides, we need to saturate them again. Um, so uh, yeah, if those crustal pathways um, allow uh, interaction with sulfur bearing sediments or, or carbon bearing sediments then then yes but that's not actually something that we we, we focused on too much at this okay. point at least but that's a good 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 question thanks i've got a cheeky follow-up on that one um yeah, on. in the <laughs> sorry uh, in the in the uh, upper and mid levels of your model you've got some sort of like uh, larger ponding or larger intrusive system um do you ever get any uh, textures within your your blebs which suggest any kind of um large scale uh, convection cells, which which would concentrate your your bubbles towards the the surface and edges of your deposit, hence the hence the Mordor um, I, model. I, I I just missed the last part of that question. Do you can you, can you repeat it? Please? Sorry, yeah. So um, in the in the upper and mid levels, um, you get like a ponding or a large scale intrusive system. Um, mm. inside those, do you ever get any convection textures which suggest that the bubbles are on the on, on the tops and the sides of your intrusives? similar to the model style okay so um yeah that's a good question so the 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 ones that we've studied in the in the mid crust um the these blebby sulfides tend to be around the margins and there's, uh, there's maybe crude um zonations but there's no real sort of um layering as such or um beautiful convection text which is let's say like in a scare guard. <laughs> yeah. um, so no, I, th I think probably what's happening is that the reason why we're getting preservation of these um, bloody bubbly sulfides towards the margins is simply because they've cooled reasonably quickly such that they've actually managed to track these things before they've floated off um, up to the top, um, for example. Okay, cool. How's that? Okay. I got like a question that kind of follows up on that, not not directly, but um, like where, where you would be sort of exalting a, a CO2 rich uh, supercritical fluid, as you said, uh, do you get any alteration that looks like um, like listwinites or like the talc metamorphic series or something that you'd see in ultramafix that are affected by CO2 rich fluids like on the margins or anything like that? Does it like self metasomatize, I guess? Ah, yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, no, not really. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that we noticed that these are actually pretty clean um, textures. So we think we, we're, we're crystallizing uh, primary carbonates from that supercritical fluid um, as a sort of, you've got a three-way system of sulfide liquid, uh, CO2 supercritical fluid, uh, and um, silicates. Um, but no, they, no uh, that, that's not to say it's not there. Uh, this might be a case of going back and having a look and going, oh, wait a minute. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, um, I don't see another question in the chat, so I'm just going to ask one that's actually a pretty dumb question probably for you. Um, I, I, so I, I, like, no, I mean, like, I don't understand magmatic systems well, right? So I, I like orogenic gold stuff, right? So um, yeah, yeah. I know that like, uh, like carbon speciation in hydrothermal fluids has a huge role on like pH. So like with the uh, carbonate, like carbonic acid and having CO2 and all that really affects the pH of a fluid. 
does it affect magmas too? Like if you're putting carbon in a magma and pulling it out and having all of that, are magmas affected by pH in a similar way? Like, does that affect metal concentrations at all? Is that a thing? Um, you said that was a dumb question, but uh, I'm not sure. Well, I, I don't know. I just, I, <laughs> I'm just, I'm ignorant. I'm just blissfully ignorant. I don't know how pH um, and magmas work other than, you know, there's like basic and acidic, but like, yeah, does carbon play a role in that in speciation? Um, yes, it will. And certainly if you um, contaminate with, so if, if you stick in a load of like limestone into these things, it will be volatilized and, and cause change in that. What that will probably do is uh, affect metal mobility into the hydrothermal um, phases. So depending on that uh, pH and the oxidation state, you might things like gold uh, and copper out of this more um, magmatic um, sulfide sort of style, I think. Cool. So we have, we, I won't, I don't have another question, which is great because someone else has one. Uh, <laughs> we have one from uh, Manuel Nokia. I hope I said that right. I'm going to go ahead and ask him to unmute. Um, so I'm going to, I want to do that right now and he can ask you his question directly. Thank you so much, Chris, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, David, for this brilliant talk. I would like to know, uh, how does carbon dioxide dissociate oxal during uh, in deeper crust? Is it? Are we suggesting a boiling or immiscibility in deeper crust to have uh, carbon dioxide saturated melt? Because carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide may be occurring with other components in the fluid. So how do we separate them? Yeah, so it, it is an immiscibility. Um, uh, so a little bit like wine, but it's a supercritical fluid rather than a gas. Um, I've maybe simplified things by just saying that it's uh, pure CO2. It's almost certainly not pure CO2. There'll be some water in there and maybe a few other components um, as well. But yeah, we see it like, like as a, when it becomes saturated, you, you, you then get a, yeah, a little bit like the boiling, you will produce um, immiscible um, supercritical uh, fluid droplets or, or bubbles um, in the same way that we produce um, immiscible droplets of sulfide, yeah, in those deeper, deeper crusts, yeah. Thank you. Aaron, do you have any questions yeah. coming in on YouTube? No, YouTube is, is, uh, is dried up. We had uh, almost 30 people on earlier, but uh, they're slowly logging off as we wind down the session. Um, if anyone has any last questions, um, now's the time. Otherwise, we're going to let Dave off the hook here pretty soon. OK. <laughs> so, I, I, I um, think we might be in the clear. Yeah, okay. I have I have one more fun one, and this this has okay. a little bit more to do with uh, with with the mortar complex and sort of the funding of the armies of Middle Earth. Do you think that the gold and PGE enrichment of the Alkali systems of Mount, Mount Doom helped fund Sauron's uh, sort of sort of conquest of of Middle Earth? <laughs> oh, almost certainly. <laughs> almost certainly. It's, uh, it that's why. Like that's that. why. That's why he protects it uh, so much. <laughs> I wonder what the metal content of that ring is. Uh, it's pretty <laughs> dense, I think. <laughs> uh, big... but, but we're, uh, we're, we're marching as little hobbits, still, still trying to trying to get there. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Dave, for the, the great talk today. Um, I learned a lot about uh, these, these alkalic systems and magmatic sulfides, uh, and I, I think everybody everybody did. So, okay, yeah, great, it was awesome. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna How sign off. Thank you everyone. guys for, for 